All right, so we're in the final week of this series called All You Need Is, and it's a four-week series on generosity and financial health, and you know that um, you know, it's one of our core values as a church. Our core values are pray, give, invite, mentor, and serve, and uh, one of those core values is that we want to be a generous uh, community. We, we, want, we want the church to be seen as a generous institution, a generous organization in this community. We want people, when they think about Fairfax Church, they think about a place that is generous and is pouring into this county and this community. And we want to have a congregation that is filled with people who are living out, like living generous lives in every way, generous financially, generous with their time, your talents, your treasure, um, your gifts, your passions, everything, just to live wildly uh, generous lives. Like that's our passion as a church because generosity is a huge part of becoming the person that God created you to be. Like the the reason that you're on the planet is to live that out because our God is a generous God. And since we're created in his image, we were created to be generous people. Like that's one of the reasons that, that God has placed us here to live these generous lives. Generosity is not an obligation. Whenever we talk about generosity, it's not an obligation. It's not just an act of obedience. Generosity is an opportunity to reflect the image of God in our lives. Like, that's what generosity is all about. And as I've mentioned every week, we're gonna end the series, which is this week, uh, with this workshop, Pursuing Financial Health. And it's actually happening today right after this uh, service. And uh, it's a workshop that's designed to give you some practical handles on some of the things that we've been talking about uh, biblically, theologically, philosophically, all of that to kind of give you some more practical Handles And the response to the workshop has been incredible. I was just told before we came into this service, we have 184, we have a 200-person capacity for this thing, like every seat taken, every table taken. We're at 184 in terms of registrations. And so we still have space for a few people, most of you that are going to attend. You've already registered. You're here. It's awesome. But if you've been thinking about it over these last few weeks and uh, you're here and you're saying, uh, man, I would just, I would like to go to that. I would just encourage you while I'm talking, like while I'm talking, while I'm preaching, like you have permission to just get signed up, just to register right now. You can use your phone, you can tap the sticker that's on your seat, or you can uh, tap in to the, the QR code if you're online, uh, it's on the screen. If you want to use the QR code and you're here, you can do that and get registered. I have a feeling that by the time like we get to the end of the service and everything's get going, that we, we may not have space for walk-ins. And so if you, if you really would like, if you haven't signed up and you really would like to go, I just would encourage you to get uh, signed up. Uh, if you don't do that and you still want to try to walk in, feel free uh, to do that as well. Dr. Jerry Fox, who uh, taught financial planning, he was a professor at Andrews University in uh, the Fall School of Business at AU. AU is where I graduated from, an alumni of uh, Anderson University, and he's currently on staff with Servant Solutions as the director of, uh, of finance, of, of, of financial planning, and uh, he's the one who's been leading this. We've been talking about Dr. Fox and looking forward to him being here, and uh, he and his wife, Debbie, are actually in the service uh, today, and uh, I have a connection with Debbie because uh, Debbie also teaches at Ansh University and has a, has a significant role there, but she's also the chair of the Madison Park Church in Anderson that I'm on the board of and love that congregation and uh, have just kind of fallen in love with what's going on there, and so we get a chance to connect uh, through those board meetings as well. But I want to invite Dr. Fox uh, onto the platform, and so would you just give just a huge Fairfax welcome to Dr. Jerry Fox's wife, Debbie. Hey, man. Uh, welcome, welcome. Jerry, we're so glad that you're here. Debbie, we're so glad to have you with us today. So we've been looking forward to this uh, workshop and um, just wanted to give people a little bit of an idea of like what we're going to be dealing with, but just also a little bit about you uh, because it's been a kind of neat journey of how you ended up kind of doing what you're doing. So talk a little bit about your journey in terms of finance and all the things that you've been doing? Well, like your pastor, Rod, my dad was a Church of God pastor as I was growing up, 
And I so admired my parents and their call and answering that and leading congregations like you. Um, but I didn't necessarily feel gifted and called to do that kind of thing myself. And so as a teenager, I, I had given my life to Christ, and I wanted to find what God's call in my life might be. And I'm 15, about to turn 16, and every 16-year-old young man in here, what's your next thing on your list of things you want to do in your life? I want to get my first car, right? So I had been working for some farmers and at a grocery store, saved up a little bit of money, and had a savings account, but it was short of what I needed to get the kind of car I wanted. So my dad said, you know, this is probably a good time. Let's, let's go to the bank, meet with a loan officer, and for you to kind of understand what that's all about. So we go and sit down with Lefty Hollenbeck, Lefty the loan officer. His wife is my, um, is my English teacher at uh, high school, and his daughter is actually in my class. But we sit down with him, and I'm 15, not even 16 yet, and he treats me like I am the most important customer he will see all week long. And he sits down and starts asking me, okay, now how much money have you saved? How much are you earning? Uh, if you get this car, it's not just purchasing it, but it's maintaining it, putting a license on it, and, and getting insurance. And uh, it's an older car, so you're going to have to have some repairs. And, all. and he talks through my whole budget, and he goes, now, what about beyond this car? What do you want to do with the rest of your life? You're going to go to college? Well, yeah. Are you saving for that yet? Well, a little bit. And he talks through all that with me. And he goes, now, you got a couple more years of high school. Do you have some plans of some things you want to do? Like, are you going to go to prom? Or are you going to... He talks through my whole life with me. And we get back in the car. And I turned to my dad and I said, you know what? I think I know what God may be calling me to do. Wow. As a pastor, most of the families that you work with Finances is an issue in their lives. It's either the cause of conflict or because of conflict that they already have, it's a tool that they use to beat each other up a little bit, right? And so I said, maybe this is something that Scripture is all over, what God has to say about money. He knows what a, a tool it is in our lives, but also what a temptation it is to make that our master rather than him. Maybe this is what I should be preparing for. So mm -hmm. I followed that call since I was 16, Rod, That's and uh, cool. for the last 40 years, I've taught students at Anderson University. Wow. That. I love that. Very cool. So talk just a little bit about what we're going to be dealing with at the workshop. One of the things that um, even people who have grown up in the church and have a, a basis of faith and know that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, look, I know you worry about what you're going to wear. I know you worry about what you're going to eat, but I'm going to tell you, seek first the kingdom Seek what God is up to in this world and in your life in particular, and all of these things are going to be added to you as well. Even people who know that still struggle with habits, and I know I, I caught the first service, so I know you're going to bring that word up a little bit. What do we do habitually? We do what is familiar, what's comfortable, what's convenient, and it may not be what's going to lead us to what's best, right? I mean, you all know how to be healthy, don't you? Eat right and exercise regularly, but do we do it? No, you know, we don't, not unless we get into the habit that it feels funny if I don't go run today or if I do eat something that I know isn't good for me. We need better habits. So what we're going to talk about is what are the key things that can help us identify behaviors that are going to get us more toward what is going to be in our best interest and extend the kingdom. And we're going to talk about building those right kind of habits yeah. and try and give some very practical things to help that get started. Very, very cool. And you've brought uh, kind of a, it's like a journey, a journal uh, kind of thing that's a resource, not just for folks that go to the workshop, but for the whole congregation. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. While I was still teaching at AU, uh, a good friend of both Rod and mine, a guy named Jeff Janess, ran Servant Solutions. We provide retirement plans for your church staff here and people in mission and churches and Christian colleges around the world. But he asked if I would put together a seven-day, uh, essentially a devotional, but something that if you spent about 30 minutes a day in it would take you through what God's Word has to say about building those habits. And it's called Live Free. And so it's a booklet that we'll use during the workshop today. Uh, it's also available um, here at the church, we've yeah. given the QR code to be able to go right to that. It's also available in Spanish, if that is your preferred first language, uh, to do that. But it's something that 
uh, is using so many of the scriptures. I've, I've been following this sermon series every week, and I'm anxious to hear uh, today's sermon as well. But all the scriptures that Pastor Rod has been sharing with you, we use as foundations in there, but then it takes you from the scripture, how do you apply this in your own life uh, to lead you to the things that are making you a better steward of what God's given in your life? Yeah, it's very, very cool. And it's available uh, individually to do. I mean, groups could do it. Uh, Absolutely. Do it individually. Uh, you'll have a paper version of it back for the workshop. We but, will. Uh, the QR code is available. Uh, they can tap uh, on the sticker and they can get the Absolutely. information on it. So that's very, very cool. Thank you for bringing that Absolutely. as a resource. Jerry, we are so excited that you are here. We've been praying for this day, looking forward to this day. We're glad that Debbie could join you and both of you could be here uh, would you once again just show your appreciation, Thank Jerry? You. Great to be with you. All right, I'm going to let them sneak out. Uh, Jerry's got to get set up for the workshop, and uh, I wouldn't make him sit through the sermon again ever. So, uh, Jerry and Deb, I'm going to let you slip out. Would you once again just show your appreciation to, to them? So when we do a series, and this is true about any of the series that we do, but it's especially true about uh, this financial series, it's kind of like streaming a show on Netflix or whatever the streaming service is that you use. Like when you stream a show, you don't really get the whole uh, storyline or the whole narrative in one episode. You have, to, you, have to li- you have to listen or watch all of the episodes to really kind of get a picture of the whole story. And uh, the reality is people that, that create those uh, shows, they know not everyone will probably see every episode, or even if they do see every episode, they'll forget life happens, they'll forget what has happened in the previous episodes. And so oftentimes when they start a new episode, they'll start with this kind of previously on, and then they'll show all the things that have kind of happened in the previous episodes that are going to connect with what's going to happen in this particular episode. And so we're going to, I just want to do that today. Uh, just want to do a previously, previously on, like uh, all you need is, and uh, talk about the episodes that have led up to this final episode. In our first episode, we talked about the gods of prosperity, the gods of wealth, the gods of consumerism that tend to drive our culture. And, and we talked about how this is one of the reasons that Jesus spends so much energy, so much time, 15% of everything that Jesus says has to do with our resources. And the other thing we talked about in the first episode is the ownership issue. That when it comes to our money, it's important to remember that God is the owner, that we are the stewards, that God is the investor and we are his money managers. We are entrusted with the responsibility of investing that which God has entrusted to our care according to his purposes, according to his mission, according to his will. In the second episode, we talked about what it means to, to truly trust God with our resources and how difficult sometimes that can be. Uh, God has entrusted all of this to our care, and what does it mean to like fully trust that back to him? And I gave you an acronym that came from a guy named Joe Sangal. The acronym was G-S-I-P-T-R. It stands for Give, Save, Invest, and plan the rest. And we talked about like, what does it look like to live that out? And then in the third episode last week, we talked about the challenges that we face to actually be good money managers, that good financial management is hard. And as a culture, we just aren't particularly good at it. In fact, in our culture, we don't really have so much We don't have really a wealth problem as much as we have a management problem, even in the church when it comes to our finances and it comes to our prayer life and the prayers that we pray related to our financial situations and what we're going through and all of that, that so often our prayer life is focused on helping, asking God to help us to have more, to have more resources rather than asking God to help us to manage better that which he has entrusted to our care. So that was the first three episodes. In this final episode, as Jerry mentioned, I wanna talk about the habit of generosity. And the reason I wanna talk about the habit of generosity is because oftentimes we think about living generous lives, what 
first kind of comes to our mind is spontaneous acts of generosity. Like we see a need and we respond to it. We see something that needs kind of to be addressed and so we respond to it. It's kind of like the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan saw this man who had fallen by the wayside, who had been robbed and beaten up and he saw the need that he was facing and he just spontaneously responded to that need and he put him on his own donkey and he took him to an inn and he paid for him to stay at the inn and he took care of this man, which is absolutely amazing stuff. That, that, is, one of the, that is one of the really important expressions of generosity, just spontaneous generosity, just seeing a need and responding. But the Bible also talks about the habit of generosity. It talks about the discipline of generosity. It talks about how generosity is a spiritual discipline in our life the same way that prayer is a spiritual discipline and Bible study is a spiritual discipline and worship is a spiritual discipline. That not only are we called to be spontaneous with our generosity, we're also called to be intentional with our generosity to be even systematic with our generosity. And there's lots of examples of this in the biblical narrative. One one of the most interesting is, uh, I'm gonna give you several, but one of the most interesting is Leviticus, where the people of God are being instructed by God uh, to take care of the poor and the immigrant that are in their communities, of responding to the poor and the immigrant in their communities. And in order to accomplish this, This is what God instructs them to do. Remember now, it's an agrarian society, and so everything is going to be kind of in that context. But in order to respond to the needs of the poor and in order to respond to the needs of the immigrant, this is what what God tells the people of Israel to do. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick over it again or Pick up the grapes that have fallen to the ground. Leave all that stuff. Leave all of that for the poor. Leave all of that for the immigrant, for the alien. I am the Lord, your God. So God is giving the Israelites a systematic way to provide for the poor. He's giving them a generous habit that they can actually integrate into the fabric of their lives. Every time they harvest a field, they are to intentionally leave a percentage of the field not harvested. And in leaving a percentage of the field not harvested, the poor and the immigrant can come along and harvest that that is left for themselves. In Genesis 28, generations before the law, the Mosaic law, which is oftentimes what we refer to when we refer to intentional generosity or habit of generosity, but way before all of that, we see Jacob who is preparing to leave home for the first time, preparing to go on his own financially for the very, very first time, and he vows to tithe back to the Lord the resources that God is about to entrust to his care. God hasn't even provided the resources yet, and Jacob, as he leaves home, as he prepares to go out on his own financially, he vows to to give back to the Lord a tithe, 10% of that which God is going to entrust to his care. And then God gives the law to Moses, and, and we see tithing become a part of like the way that the people of God relate, the covenantal relationship that the people of God have with God. We see the principle of the tithe like reinforced over and over again in the Mosaic law, but we also see it reinforced by the prophets. The prophets talk about this idea of the habit of generosity, this idea of tithing. The prophet Malachi says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have any room for it, not have enough room for it. And then you, say that you see that same kind of intentionality in uh, an event that takes place in 1 Corinthians 16. And the context for the event, uh, it's really interesting it's what, what Paul does. Paul is collecting an offering 
for the church in Jerusalem that has fallen on difficult financial times. And he's going around to all the other churches uh, collecting money from those churches to be able to respond to the needs of the church in Jerusalem. And what he tells the Corinthians as he writes to them and talks about this offering that he's going to collect and all of that, he tells the Corinthians to set aside a sum of money on the first day of every week so that when he comes, he won't, they won't have to scramble to take a special offering. They won't have to kind of do something spontaneous to try to respond to the need. They'll actually already have saved up the money in order to be able to respond to the need. It's kind of the first example that we read about like just basic generosity budgeting, uh, budgeting around giving. He's, he's just saying, I want you, on the first day of every week, I want you to take a percentage, a sum of what you make in accordance with what you make, and I want you to set it aside. I want you to budget for us. I want budget for it. I want to set it aside so that when I come, you'll have the resources to respond to this need. Don and I have maintained a budget uh, our entire marriage. I, I, actually, I shared the first week that we didn't have a budget the first year of our marriage, and, um, and that was not, not good. And I went to my brother Gil and said, hey, can you help me with this? And Gil was, you know, my older brother, 17 years older than me. He'd kind of worked through all of this stuff and worked through a budget with me and how to maintain a budget, not just how to set up a budget, but how to actually maintain a budget so that you actually refer to it and use it and it guides you and all of that. Like it's one thing to like set up a budget, like we sometimes we all set up budgets and then we can't figure out how to like maintain them. But he helped me to, to do all of that. And in our budget, like from the very beginning, we built generosity into our budget. We, we start with a tithe that we give to the church, to the local church, the church that we're a part of, and we put that in the budget. So we just start with that 10% in the budget. And then we put in money uh, in our budget that we want to give over and above a tithe. And uh, sometimes it's money that we want to give over and above the tithe to the church. Sometimes we want to give it to another organization. There's other great organizations that we sponsor and support. Sometimes we want to give over and above our tithe to an individual, an individual maybe that is in need in some way. But whatever it is, like we put in there this amount for, uh, for things that we want to do over and above uh, our budget. And then we even budget for, it's kind of another category we even budget for kingdom needs that God may call us to respond to during the year that we have no way of knowing like what they are. Like when we set our budget, we do a yearly budget, and when we set our budget, we don't know the opportunities that God's going to set before us to respond to needs spontaneously that, that he provides and opportunities that he provides to give. And so we put uh, a budget line item, and we just call it kingdom opportunities. That's what we call it in our budget. And it's a way to be able to respond spontaneously to needs that God brings in, to our attention during the course of the year, and yet still do it and remain financially healthy. Now, even Jesus, sometimes we talk about, oh, well, it's the Old Testament talks about the tithe, the New Testament doesn't talk about the tithe, but even Jesus talks about the tithe. But his focus is on actually moving beyond the tithe to an increasingly generous life. He actually raises the standard like he does with everything else from the Mosaic law. Like Jesus, if you read the, the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus just has this whole soliloquy of, of things where he says, you know, you have heard it said, but I say to you. You have heard it said, but I say to you. And, and it's always about, you have heard it said, and he refers to the Old Testament Mosaic law, but I say to you, and then he he talks about his own standard that goes way beyond that. And so if, like, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, if you want to reflect the, the, the ethic of Jesus, like that's, that's where you understand the ethic of Jesus. For instance, he talks about how the law, the Old Testament law, said don't commit murder, but then Jesus says that anyone who hangs on to anger against someone is actually subject to judgment. Uh, the Old Testament law said don't commit adultery, but Jesus said anyone who nurtures lust in their heart for someone is already committed adultery in their heart. 
Uh, the Old Testament, the Mosaic law said that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but Jesus said if someone strikes you on one cheek, turn the other cheek to them. And the list just goes on and on and on and on, where Jesus takes whatever the Old Testament law is, whatever the Mosaic law is, and he raises, never lowers the standard, he always raises the standard. And he does the same thing with tithing. Look at what he says to the religious leaders of the day who were fastidious tithers, like they were faithful, faithful tithers, the religious leaders. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tithe, you, t- you tithe, you give a tenth of everything. You give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, your cumin, all of that, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced, he said, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Jesus, um, one thing's about the way Jesus taught is that so often, you know, we live in an either-or culture. Like you're either this or you're this. You either believe this or you believe this. You either support this group or you support this group. We kind of live in an either-other culture and either-or culture, and culture kind of wants us to make either-or decisions. But Jesus, when he taught, was not an either-or teacher. Oftentimes, he was a both-and teacher. And, and he acknowledges, as he's talking about this whole issue, he acknowledges that the Jewish leaders are totally committed to the tithe, that they tithe on everything. They even tithe on the spices that they have in their cupboard. But that's where their generosity ends, like it ends there. Like they weren't generous people when it came to confronting injustice. They weren't generous people when it came to extending mercy to others. They weren't generous people when it came to showing compassion for others. They weren't generous people when it came to like walking out their faith. And it's interesting how Jesus responds. He doesn't tell them to stop tithing and to start focusing on these other things. His message isn't an either or message, like either tithe or be focused on the issue of of fighting injustice, either tithe or be focused on the issue of showing mercy, either tithe or be focused on the issue of extending compassion. His message is a both and message. He tells them that they should keep tithing, and also use their resources to confront injustice and extend mercy and show compassion. Jesus literally says you should practice the latter, justice, mercy, compassion, without neglecting the former, tithing on that which God has entrusted to your care. In other words, Jesus is saying, I want you to grow in the grace of God of giving. It's the same thing that the Apostle Paul says to the church in 2 Corinthians 8 when he says, but just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel, excel in this grace of giving. Now, let me just remind you of three things. Three reasons, maybe is a better way to say it, of why the habit of generosity, as we look at this issue of generosity, why the habit of generosity is so important. The first thing is the habit of generosity moves generosity to the front of the line in our lives. My experience has been that most people who love God, who, 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 live in, who wanna live in obedience to God, who, who want to be increasingly generous people, who want to be in the yes position to God when it comes to their finances and all of that. Um, But they struggle with that because after they've paid their mortgage and the car loans and the credit cards and the utilities and the tuition payments and they bought a few clothes and they've eaten out a few times and they've taken care of the unexpected expenses that always happen, there just isn't much left, especially in a place like Fairfax in in the Washington, D.C. area which is why the habit of generosity is so important. The writer of Proverbs was talking about the habit of generosity when he says in Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Now keep in mind, this is all in an agrarian society, so they're gonna be talking about harvests and crops and all that when we're talking about possessions. Now we see this principle 
of first fruits throughout the Bible. In an agrarian society, the first fruits were the portion of the harvest that was harvested first. And generally, it was considered the absolute best part of the harvest. The Israelites were instructed by God to bring those first fruits to the temple as an act of worship and as an act of thanksgiving. Offering the first fruits of the harvest was an act of trust. It was trusting that God would provide the rest of the harvest. You know, the harvest didn't come in all at once. Like the harvest would oftentimes come in in stages. So the first fruits, when they came in, they were the only fruits that came in. So it was an incredible act of trust to entrust the first fruits to the Lord, trusting that the rest of those, the rest of the harvest was going to come in. It was this act of trust that God would continue to provide. It was a reliance on God's ongoing provision and care. The first fruits of the harvest represented actually the whole harvest. So by offering the first fruits to the Lord, the person was acknowledging that the whole harvest actually belongs to the Lord. That's what the habit of generosity does. It acknowledges that the whole harvest, everything that God has entrusted to our care belongs to the Lord. And it makes sure that God doesn't end up with our financial leftovers. It makes sure that God gets our first fruits and not our last fruits. One of the ways that Don and I um, have made sure, you know, and we've lived in Fairfax for uh, 37 years and all, we know the journey, like we know the journey as it relates to the cost of this place and, and um, just how much the cost of living is and putting your kids through college and all the unexpected expenses that can go with owning a home and all that kind of stuff. And one of the ways that Don and I have made sure that we have given God the first fruits of that which he has entrusted to our care is by setting up, for us, it's been setting up a recurring gift to the church that happens at the first of the month, like the very first of the month before we spend money on anything else, before we spend money on mortgage stuff or other car loans or, or uh, kids' education or whatever it is, we bring our first fruits to the Lord. And now you can automate your giving, which technologically you couldn't do years ago, but now you can automate it. And so we've automated that because we want to make sure it happens no matter what else is going on in our lives, whether we're traveling, whether we're on vacation, whether we're dealing with some unexpected expenses, whether we're dealing with unexpected health concerns like we've gone through recently, whatever life throws at, it, we, throws at us, we want to make sure God gets the first fruits of our finances and not the leftovers. That's the first thing. Second thing is that the habit of generosity actually increases our trust in God. I know that for some of you, um, talking about this stuff is like really scary and really hard. And particularly talking about the habit of generosity can be absolutely overwhelming, uh, especially the idea of tithing. Like, for some of you, as we talk about tithing and giving the first 10% to the Lord, you can't even imagine, especially living in a place like Fairfax, you can't even imagine living on the 90%. And, and I just want you to know, like, as if it's a new concept, if it's something that you've struggled with, if it's something that the way in which you've structured your life is just like, oh, I don't even know how to get my mind around all of that and never really kind of understood all of that. And I'm looking at all of this through a different lens than I've ever looked at it before in my life. And I'm looking at the ownership issue in a different way than I've ever looked at it before. I just want you to know it's okay. Like God understands your fears. He understands your situation, your circumstances, what you're going through. And what God knows and is most focused on is your heart like a heart that wants to, to grow in the grace of giving, a heart that wants to become increasingly generous, like he gets that. For others of you, tithing is already a regular part of your life. It's a discipline that you started. For some of you, it's a discipline that you started years ago. For some of you, it's a discipline that you started when you were a kid. Like when you got your first dollar, you gave a dime, and you got $10, you gave a dollar. You got $100, you gave $10, just like... Like tithing is like breathing. It's just like 
part of your life. It's just the way that you've always lived your life. You've learned to live on the 90%. And in doing so, you've you've experienced God's provision over and over and over again. And then for others of you, the tithe actually is just the starting point of your generosity. Like if you began to tithe, for some of you, if you began to tithe today, you would actually decrease your giving because you continue to look for more and more ways to use, use the resources that God has entrusted to your care to advance the kingdom. In fact, some of you may even have, uh, and this is a real thing, you may even have the spiritual gift of generosity. Like God has blessed you abundantly, you have stewarded what he has given you well, and God has positioned you to use your resources to advance the kingdom in ways that others can't or others won't. Generosity is just like a part of your calling. I mean, all of us are called to live generous lives, but I really do believe, and you see it in Scripture, and I certainly have seen it played out in the life of the church, that there are some people who God has just given a unique spiritual gift of generosity that positions them and has positioned them in a way to make kingdom impact in just a way that that others can't or others are not willing to do. And wherever you fall on that spectrum, here's the thing I just want to say, wherever you fall on that spectrum, whether this whole idea of, of percentage giving and the habit of giving is just like, I don't understand how we could even do that or whether you've tithed your whole life or whether you go way beyond the tithe and you're giving in incredibly generous ways in in ways way beyond all of that. Like wherever you fall on that spectrum, here's what I want to challenge you to do over the next 12 months. I want to challenge you to do what the Apostle Paul talks about. I want to challenge you to grow in the grace of giving, like whatever that means. If you've never established a habit of giving, then establish it. And whatever it is, like whatever the amount is, like establish a habit of giving. Like start somewhere and then grow in the grace of giving. Pray, ask God how much you should give. God knows your circumstances. He knows your heart. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows your situation. So put yourself in the yes position to God and just trust him with this stuff. And if you've already established the habit of giving in your life, which so many of you have already established that habit of giving, then pray and ask God what it looks like in your situation to grow in the grace of giving this year. You know that whatever that is, it will stretch you. It always does. It will stretch you in some way. It will teach you how to trust God even more. It's just the nature of When we grow in the grace of giving, we grow in our trust in God and his provision. And then lastly, the habit of generosity actually increases our joy. When when Paul was writing to the church in Corinth about the generosity of the church in in Macedonia, so, so Paul's taking up an offering for the church in Jerusalem that's fallen on hard times financially. And he's, he's taking this offering up in churches that are in a lot of different places financially. So the Corinthian church was like the affluent church. It was a church that had lots of resources, lots of people that had great jobs, made lots of money, had lots of disposable income, all of that, and, and they had a lot that they could give. The Macedonian church was a, a fairly poor church. It was an under-resourced congregation. And so when Paul is writing to the church in Corinth about this offering, he references the church in Macedonia. And this is what he says. Out of there, talking about um, the Macedonian church, out of their most severe trial, their overflowing joy, their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Over their uh, most severe trial, their overflowing joy welled up in rich generosity. There's this connection between joy and generosity, that that joy leads to generosity and that generosity leads 
to joy. It's this kind of circle that just keeps going, that as, as we experience joy, we become more and more generous, and as we become more and more generous, we experience more and more joy. Paul's talking specifically about the church in Macedonia, but it's just true for all of us. Generosity brings joy. There's a joy in seeing the impact that our generosity has. There is a joy in seeing how God provides when we live generous lives. It's been interesting. I was telling the first service that whenever I do this series, um, I always get lots of help from other people in the congregation, people that come up to me or write me, email me, uh, that have uh, uh, advice, maybe, about things that I should say or not say or what should we talk about and what I should emphasize and the, the message you should have and all that kind of stuff. So, like, it's just, I don't know, there's some, something about this stuff, no matter what else I talk about, I can talk about revelation, I can talk about sex, I can talk about any of that. I don't get the same level of advice that I get when I talk about money. So I talk about money and, like, people are just like, ah, I just I want to tell you some things. I want to tell you some stuff. And it's just been really cool because um, the conversation, I've had a lot of conversations, and the conversations I had, generally they fall along the same line. It's like, whether they say it this way or not, it's like, Rod, don't leave out about the joy. Don't, don't let the congregation miss about the joy that comes when we live generous lives, about the way that God provides for us and story after story after story after story of person who says you know this was a struggle for me and then something broke and God's spirit broke into my heart and and I began to trust him on this and 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 when that happened I began to see his provision in ways I had never seen it before I began to experience a joy that I had never experienced before like don't forget the joy there is joy. There is joy that comes, this joy that grows when we live these generous lives. In Luke 6, Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The habit of generosity increases our joy because it gives us the opportunity to see God provide in fresh new ways. We serve, as I said at the beginning of this message, we serve a generous God. And Jesus' death on the cross is the ultimate expression of his generosity, that he gave his life so that we could experience life. He he entered into death so that we could enter into life. He entered into darkness so that we could enter into light. He entered into despair so that we could enter into hope. It's the It's the greatest expression of God's generosity. And our generosity flows out of his generosity. Like it has to be that way, that our generosity flows out of his generosity. Generosity is joyless. Generosity is nothing but an obligation if it's not rooted in the generous love of God. So I want to end this series by just, one, by just giving thanks. Just giving thanks for the generosity of God. Giving thanks for this generous God who was willing to lay down his life for us so that we could experience life. Just to say, God, thank you for that. Like we will never be able to to say thank you enough. We will never be able to repay. We can't even begin to repay. Just God, thank you for the generosity of your spirit that gave, gave, gave. 
your very life for us. And then I just also, as we close out this series, I know we've been talking about money and finances and all that kind of stuff. That's important stuff and helps us to grow and to experience joy and all the things that I've talked about. But it's all rooted in whether we have ever really experienced the generous love of God in our own life. And for anyone who is here today that maybe has never experienced this generous love, has never said yes to what Jesus did for you on the cross, whether you're in the sanctuary here, whether you're with us online, whether you're out in the great room, whether you're in the hangar, wherever you are, like you, if you were just to be really candid and say, I, I understand it, it I, I, I get, I hear it, I understand it at that level, but I, I really have never personalized it. I've never brought it inside into my own heart. I've never really said yes to this generous love of a God who loves me so much he'd rather die for me than live separate from me. I just want to give you the opportunity today as we wrap this whole thing up just to say yes to this generous love. God, we give you thanks for all the ways that you teach us And uh, we thank you for the way that you teach us when it comes to the handling of our resources and possessions. We know that it's um, an important part of our journey of faith and and, and, and so impacts, um, you know, our relationship at times with you. And and, and so, Lord, we we give you thanks for all of the, the teaching that you give us and We give you thanks for the insights that you give us in your word. But Lord, above and beyond everything else, we give you thanks for for your generosity to us. What you have done for us on the cross. And for anyone who is here today that has never said yes to your generous love, I pray that today is the day that they say yes to your forgiveness and your grace, to the opportunity to wipe the slate clean, to start over, to start afresh, to not be controlled by the past any longer, to be raised to life in Christ. May they say yes, even in this moment, yes to you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Let's stand together.